All righty. It's about 4.30, so I'll start. Hi, everyone. My name is Varjits Jiva, and I'm going to talk to you guys about how I got annoyed with a bunch of paywalls while I was trying to program my digital gauge cluster into my Cadillac ATSV, figured it out, put it up on GitHub, and helped a bunch of people. So I have 35 slides in 25 minutes, so we're going to get going. So the overview for this talk, I'm going to introduce myself on the project, what project points made this possible, how the hell I figured it out, the high-level process results in the future of GM programming and open source. So an introduction to myself, I'm just a software engineer, but I'm into cars. I grew up in the Fast and Furious era, so I was into Japanese cars for a long time. So, and I somehow ended up buying a Cadillac ATS-V earlier this year. It was a six-speed manual with 400 wheel horsepower, and I love that thing. I fall more in love with it every single day. But I almost didn't buy it. Why? Because it came with a gauge cluster on the left. It's needles. 2016 to 2019, this car was made, and GM shipped it with needles. The rest of the fleet that they had had digital gauge clusters with the fancy stuff you see on the right, but for my car, they never made it. But I bought, uh, bit the bullet and bought the car because, turns out, people were selling programming services to retrofit a digital gauge cluster into my car. So when I went into that, there was one dude that was like, oh, pay me 350 bucks. Then you can do it. Then some, and this was a, the only guy doing it for a long time. Then some other dude showed up from the shadows of Facebook Marketplace. It was like $250. I was like, huh? How did this guy figure it out? And then I look a little bit further. There's another guy on the Corvette forum that put a 2021 digital gauge cluster into his 2019 C7 Corvette. And I was like, huh, if those two people can figure it out, then I should be able to. And then there's a couple of people selling courses and weird tools and all these sketchy websites. I don't want to pay any of this, any of these people any money. I just want to figure it out. I don't want to go bankrupt in the process too. So what project points actually made this possible? So first, the 12.3 inch gauge cluster I'm talking about, the fully digital one, was available in a whole bunch of Cadillac models of the same year, but with different views and stuff like that. They just didn't ship it with my car. On top of that, the plug that was on the back of this thing was the same thing as my car. So that was already a good indication. Then the view that I want to see on this 12.3 inch cluster was the same thing that was available on a Cadillac CTS V Sport, which was the same engine, 3.6 liter twin turbo with the gauges and everything. It's got what I needed. And then turns out that between the needle gauge cluster and the 12.3 inch digital one, the total set of configuration flags was the exact same between the two. So basically what I'm saying is this gauge cluster could have fit my car the whole time, but GM just decided to not ship it. So that's why this programming became a thing. And here's how I figured it out. And here's the funny thing. I've added a, I've added a counter into these slides where... I people sell courses and tools on how to do this stuff and that total ran out to over a thousand dollars just to do this one thing so I'll show you through these slides how much you get to save by just listening to the presentation so from the beginning let's say you're me you have this car and you want to retrofit this cluster into it so the programming advertisement they'll tell you get any of the 12.3 inch clusters from any of the car any of the Cadillac cars from the same year and then we'll program it to show the V cluster on there and what the correct red line and all this stuff. And I was like, huh, interesting. So can I retrofit this from another car? Did they make all this custom? No, there's no way they made the graphics and stuff like that themselves. But was there a car that had the same, uh, the same basically engine and stuff that could show this, uh, the right view? It was like, yeah, it was the Cadillac CTS V Sport. So I just had to get a 12.3 inch cluster. It doesn't matter from what car show that specific car's view, and then put it into my car. So how do I make my donor, my cluster look like the one from the target vehicle? So I ended up buying a cluster from a 2017 Escalade, and I had to make it show the view for the 2017 Cadillac CTS V Sport. So the first thing I did with this cluster was pop the back of it. If you see the middle chip right there, uh, to middle to the little bit to the right, there's a silver one. That's a Texas Instruments ARM CPU. It was Linux based basically. So I'm looking at PNG files, whatever, all those graphics. So it's pretty straightforward, I guess, at that point. But the next three questions I had at this point were, one, can this cluster connect to my car? Two, are the right files on there? Do I have to get somehow patch them to get the right uh, gauge cluster to show up? And three, how do I configure the cluster to work with my car, with my specific feature set and stuff? So 
those three questions actually relate to the three steps of uh, CAN bus module programming in GM. First, you have to s configure authentication, then programming for like the general purpose firmware, software, whatever, and the setup and configuration to set the config flags according to um, the what your car uh, what your car has. So the first thing, can I just plug and play this cluster? No. The first thing that you have to do is actually make sure that the cluster can authenticate with the rest of the CAN bus. And it does that with two specific pieces of information, which is the VIN number and the security pin, which is derived from the VIN number. So all I had to do was program those onto the, onto the cluster. But how do you do that? I looked in the back of the thing. And if anyone in here has ever touched a gauge cluster before, usually this kind of information is stored on an EEPROM chip. So I already had the, one of the best things, I think, in, in this market is a CH341A EEPROM programmer, which is like $5 on AliExpress. And it turns out that the chip that was holding this was an I2C 24C16. People were selling this a tool that, could sell, that can do this programming for $100. I figured it out for $5, and I read the chip. So what I did was I read it immediately. I didn't even have to repin it. Just read the chip, dumped it, and it turns out that in plain text, the first 17 digits was the VIN number, and there's a auspicious four digits right under, which is the security pin. All I did was set those to my values for my car, and immediately it worked. It, the first thing it, this picture shows is that the cluster works with my car. It's pulling values and stuff, but it's just not showing the right thing. And I know this worked because you could see that the, the mileage for the vehicle actually showed up there. In GM, the mileage for the car is actually not stored in the gauge cluster like other cars. It's actually stored in the body control module. And if your module face will authenticate with that module because of the mismatch of the VIN and PIN, then that mileage will actually show up as dash, dash, dash. So I know I got this right because I got the... Uh, the odometer to show up actually. So cool, I got it to connect to the car. Now how do I make sure the right files and the graphics are on there? So now I'll talk a little bit about how GM programming actually works with the dealer software called SPS2. I don't exactly remember what the acronym means, but that's basically the dealer software like any other car. You get that, you get a subscription with that VIN number for, with the VIN number for your car, $45 for two years, not expensive. Then you get a, a, the dealer cable, $186, not a big deal either. So the programming step, what this does is that it loads the firmware, the, all, all the software, whatever it needs just to run the general purpose of this module. So there's even a step before this because G in, the, in the world of GM programming, people can actually check what files are going to be loaded by the software into the modules before ahead of time. And surprisingly, there was a light version of this running on the internet open to the public, which is called, which is hosted by Opal. Turns out that GM has been selling their CAN bus system to a whole bunch of other manufacturers, one of them being Opal, Skoda, I think, and then I think a Chinese manufacturer, I don't remember. But it turns out I use this website just to check what programming files are going to be loaded into this module. And I did that by taking the VIN number from my donor Escalade cluster. I took the VIN number from a Target car, which is the Cadillac CTS V-Sport, and I just ran the, conf uh, ran the programming steps to just see what VIN number, what VIN number was going to come out. These numbers are actually called calibration numbers. That's how you know. It's a unique identifier in the GM world where they say this has this specific set of files in it. That turns out, though, that the number is the exact same in both of these cars. That means that my Escalade cluster already had the views that I needed for a CTSV, which is a sports car. It was already on all these cars. I just had to be able to reveal it. And how do I do that? That gets to step number three, the setup and configuration of uh, GM programming. So now I have to actually get set the configuration values according to what I need. So a couple of slides here. This is actually some screen caps from when you actually go to get SPS2 from uh, AC Delco. You go to this website here, you sign up for your VIN number, you download the thing. It's a, it's a Java-based uh, program. And you go into here, then you see right there, instrument cluster. You go to set up a configuration, just run that. Um, and it does a two-step process where it pulls the, uh, the files from the GM servers, stores it on your computer, and then uh, programs it against your car. And it turns out that they dumped all these files to your local uh, C drive. So a couple of bonus slides here where you can save some money. $450. This one was $450, which is ridiculous. <laughs> uh, this is how to grab any bin file or config files from SPS2 for any vehicle. 
all you have to do is buy the VIN number for the car that you don't have in front of you. And then you just have to connect to your car, even though it doesn't have the right VIN number. And then just download and then run the programming for whatever you need for whatever module. It'll save the files to your computer. And then as soon as it's done downloading, yank the cable from your car. That's it. That's all I did to pull out these uh, files from the car. And the thing is, people were advertising emulators online for this. This would have cost it $450 just to do this when there's an override button right in front of you with a screen cap. So, and also those emulators get you banned from uh, the GM server. So, instead of paying $450, you press an override button, which is ridiculous. Then, another bonus slide. How to grab the security pin for a VIN number from the car for uh, a VIN number from GM. Um, so what you do here is that you actually run a dummy configuration that's just kind of safe um, because it only sets configuration flags in your module. All I did was run that with a vehicle that I don't own. Well, I don't have access to it really. And then just run it against my car. It'll just fail to authenticate with the module inside the car. So then it'll just bomb out, doesn't do anything. And then you go check inside the C drive over here. And there's a file right here called SPS tool bridge, uh, tool bridge log. Right there's the VIN number that I was attempted and the security pin that was right there. So, <laughs> right then and there, you get it for free. Well, almost for free. There's also VIN to pin services that you could buy online for $50 from some random website or you can get it from GM directly using this method. Now, before I can explain what I did for the configuration flags, I have to explain two things. What a build code and RPO code is. So, in those, in those local files I was talking about earlier, there's a build code dot build, build record dot BLD, which has your VIN number, chassis code, and then a bunch of things called RPO codes. These are build codes or like option codes for stuff in your car, like, oh, if you have a digital cluster or this fancy suspension, whatever. Then there's an S3 file right there where AC Delco publishes every single RPO code that they've ever made for GM. And you can just look it up there. And the next file that was inside the C drive was an XML file that says something quite interesting. It turns out it is a logical mapping of P underscore whatever flag that says set this flag to this value based on the existence of this RPO code and this chassis code in the car. So I looked through this and I knew that I wanted to get the gauge cluster from a CTS V Sport, which has the chassis code of 6AL69 right there. And the engine code, and turns out that right here, P DDH variant gets to set to the value of six to get the V uh, to get the V fancy um, graphic out. So all I did was edit this file to include my car, which is a six AE four seven chassis code with an engine code of LF four. I left the UDV in there and then edited my build record to have a UDV, which is for the twelve point three inch cluster. UDD is for the needle one, whatever. I just changed it, just so that everything that all the files that get enabled in, by this XML file will be for my car, so it fully works. And then as soon as I did that, saw this, ran to my car. Oh yeah, by the way, this would have cost an extra three hundred fifty dollars. We're at nine hundred fifty dollars right now already. Ran to my car, press the configuration file or press the configuration function. Turns out that also the conf the cache files on here are not checksum. You could just edit the files, and GM will just, you know, detect the the existence of the files. Not even check anything else. You click, it'll just run with the files on your disk, and then that's it. So I managed to clip programs this thing for free without paying anyone anything, which is fucking awesome. <laughs> so tying this all together, high level process. There's a list of requirements right here. I'm not gonna read this all out to you guys. Um, high level programming steps. It's just setting up your Windows laptop, then running a cluster configuration with your OEM cluster just to get the RPO codes and the XML files out. Then you um, edit the EEPROM on the cluster, which I explained earlier. Then also edit the cache files locally and then just run the configuration again. And that's it. So the future of GM programming in open source. I posted this right away on GitHub. And I posted it right away in the Cadillac forums. A few people actually got to use this and fix their own pro problems, which is really nice. But the crazy thing is I don't understand how I had to spend $1,000 just to figure this out. And thank God I did not pay any of that money because for how complicated this process was, it really wasn't that complicated. Most of this stuff was just open to the public, open to, on your laptop, open on the internet. It didn't really make sense. So I hope that with this that more people get into modifying their GM cars to do cool stuff like this without having to pay 
three hundred fifty dollars and stuff like that to do this stuff. So I really hope that this uh, helps maybe a couple people. A uh, big shout out to the DefCon conference and the Car Hacking Village for uh, selecting my talk. This is actually my first DefCon ever, so being up on the stage is crazy. So thank you guys so much, and yeah.